Hi, it's uh, Mike Splash, and I'm going to be doing this webinar this afternoon. The webinar is called Environmental Forensics, Getting It Right the First Time. I just wanted to give you a little bit about my background. I'm a geological engineer as my undergraduate degree, and I did a master's and PhD in earth science from the University of Waterloo a long time ago. I was a professor in geological engineering and environmental engineering at the University of Windsor 15 years before I came to Dragon as a the senior hydrogeologist. I've been an expert witness in several states in Canada uh, and started in 1988 and I've done things like landfills, fuel releases, chlorinated releases and large-scale dairy operations where I used environmental forensics. The first case study, I'm just going to start again, uh, was a um, it was an aluminum tube extraction um, uh, operation. There was TC in the groundwater. Um, the um, there was TCE in the groundwater in this subdivision that they used the groundwater. Uh, the, the model that the previous consultants were using was wrong. They had the groundwater flowing, contaminated groundwater, flowing onto into the subdivision when really it discharged before it got there. So we were able to save a lawsuit that the regulators were going to bring and millions of dollars in remediation. Uh, by 2014, the site had been decommissioned, we had to do some strategic soil removal, one year of groundwater monitoring. The site was closed with no further action. So getting the uh, conceptual site model was worthwhile. This is a little more complex uh, site. This, there was a thousand liter release of gasoline uh, in 2006. The remediation progress was stalled. This was actually, the release was observed, so uh, we knew exactly when it happened and where it happened. Uh, in later on in 2010, the regulator uh, was saying that there was off-site contamination over here that had to be evaluated, delineated. There were vapors in a pumping station in a sewer, and the remediation had to continue. The original conceptual site model, I won't go into details, but the, the, the key here, this is the soil BTEC, so benzene, toluene, ethyl benzene, and xylene. The, the USTs were here, and you can see there are two distinct bodies of um, contamination with nothing in between. Same with the groundwater, but the groundwater we can see is flowing this way. There was a lake down here, which kind of made sense. However, what was wrong with the conceptual site model? Well, the aerial distribution of BTEX in soil, the gap in the middle was problematic. The amount that was released was about... 740 kilograms or 1,500 pounds versus 3,000 kilograms that were observed in the soil. The depth of the impact was different on the east and west. The east and the west had different chemical ratios. The age, we could tell, the recent, basically the 2006 release was in the east but not in the west. And it turns out that there was actually, in the site history, there was a tank overlooked on the west side. And the result, oh, one other thing is we monitored groundwater continuously to see which way it flowed. And what happened was there was a lake over here controlled by a dam, sewers over here that were leaking. So there was a groundwater divide here um, that prevented chemicals from going from the USTs over to the west side. So we were able to get um, basically no further action um, by using a, a revised conceptual site model. And the regulators basically said, you know, if you'd only shown me one thing, I wouldn't believe it. But we showed them seven reasons why uh, that our client shouldn't have to do anything more. Here's uh, one we talked about before, historical gas release, who is responsible. There was impacted soil, impacted groundwater, and free product on two adjacent properties. Several potential sources we went through um, uh, kind of eliminating by ver using various forensic methods uh, where which ones could be used. We talked about um, the forensics issue, but in the end, 
the other side failed to integrate the hydrogeology, soil impact, site histories, geophysics. They, they didn't find any sources anywhere. And common sense, that was the big one. Nobody could uh, quite buy that there was jet fuel or aviation fuel or 20,000 liters of tractor fuel that was released um, quickly. After a three-week trial, the opposing attorney rhetorically asked, this is after I was on the stand for two and a half days, how can you be so sure about everything? And uh, basically, I, I didn't answer, but I was thinking the picture we see here. And finally, this is a project we're working on currently. Uh, Cold War era TCE was used to clean bombers. It got into the soil and groundwater, and it is moving towards the city well field, a place in Kansas. We've started working on this in May, and we're trying to figure out um, the extent of the problem and eventually come up with a remedial approach. But it did go to uh, mediation, our, our clients versus the U.S. government. And the U.S. government wanted to clean up the soil and groundwater by primarily doing injections. And this, we were looking at a one-time injection of, of money for doing this remediation. And the geology is like we see in the picture on the right, very complex uh, meandering stream geology. And um, in this case, it's mostly low permeability soils, which are not amenable to injection on a fixed budget. So we're still working on that, but it's very important to understand the hydrogeology, the distribution of chemicals, and fate and transport. And I'll stop there since I've gone slightly over. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, hopefully you've emailed those to, to Alan, um, and I can answer those in the, the next few minutes.